well, let the games begin. Let the wheels on the roller skates start spinning. Everybody, and welcome to Miss Shelved, your bi weekly dose of bookstore love. I'm your host, Nicole Brinkley, and we are so close to the end of season four. But I'm no less excited about today's author and bookseller combo. I'm going to introduce our author first because our author happens to be a former bookseller. It's Amy Cherix. My name is Amy Cherix. I am a children's book author. I write predominantly nonfiction books for kids of all ages, and I formerly had the best job in the world for six years as the children's book buyer at Malaprop's Bookstore and Cafe in Asheville, North Carolina. Amy is in conversation with Patricia Furnish. I'm Patricia Furnish. I work part-time at Malaprop's Bookstore in Asheville, North Carolina. Amy Cherix was my beloved colleague and it was always a pleasure to work with her, and she's my roller skating partner too. I also work as a bilingual legal assistant, and I'm a historian as well, and I have a radio show on Asheville FM. Settle in as these two do a deep dive on nonfiction and what books they absolutely fell in love with that made them become friends. Patricia, I am delighted by any chance to talk to you, but the fact that someone has given us like space in a podcast, I've been reeling about this ever since this opportunity came along. I feel, um, I feel really excited to do it. I also feel a little intimidated because you have such a uh, background uh, because I know you have a radio show. So, uh, you know, if you, if, if you see me flying off the rails here, uh, rein me in because I think you're the pro here. Okay. Well, when you and I talked about doing this, I said, well, let the games begin. Let the wheels on the roller skates start spinning because this is a, a great opportunity to just compare notes and talk about some great books and some ideas. And, you know, I'm one of your biggest fans and you you had me at roller skating and never let my heart go. Yeah, Patricia and I, if anybody listening to this appreciates a good roller skate, either in a rink or outdoors, uh, we're your people. Uh, we will rein ourselves in and talk about books tonight and not wax poetic about roller skating. But suffice it to say, whatever we're doing in life, we wish we were roller skating instead. That's, that's pretty much just the way that it is. It's true. When, when roller skating people find each other, and Amy and I found each other at the bookstore. So it was just, it was just one of those moments where two people recognized each other. And, and of course, we, we love talking about books and history. And yeah. Amy, one of the things I loved about working with you at Malaprops was watching you prepare to go to Germany and do your research for the book in the shadow of the moon and i always admired you so much for what all you did to prepare for that journey and thanks friend you're welcome do you remember when you brought that uh, photo back on your cell phone and we were standing up there at the registers yeah and i was like desperate for for one person to say amy how was your trip so that I could just, you know, do nothing but talk about what I had learned about rocket building in Nazi Germany <laughs> while I was gone for 10 days. And I should have known that you would have my back. I mean, I think we actually discovered that we loved the same kind of books before we realized that our, our, our great heart's desire was roller skating. Right. But it was such a comfort when I was searching that book to have you there because one, you're a brilliant researcher in your own right. You know so much about history. 
but also because you were just such a patient and enthusiastic listener and it was reassuring and just really satisfying to have somebody to share all that with. So thank you again. I probably thanked you profusely before, but you can't ever really thank somebody enough for something like that. It was really the reason I most was excited to talk to you about it was because, you know, the book that I was writing intersects with, you know, all of the kind of books that we love to talk about, which we'll get to. But what photo did I show you? I don't remember which one it was. It was a photo where it was um, Werner von Braun standing with some colleagues and there was a swastika just oh. hanging in the picture. Yeah. Yeah. That was after. Um, so Werner von Braun was the former Nazi officer who masterminded the Apollo moon landing. Um, after World War II, he came to the United States in secret and went on to do that. And I found this amazing photo when I was combing through the archives in Huntsville, Alabama, at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center there. Uh, they had this just huge collection of very curated information about Von Braun's life. I didn't expect to find anything scandalous there, and I did not. But what I did find, because, you know, Huntsville is very, um, it's sort of, you know, the, the rocket program built Huntsville, so Von Braun is beloved there. And I found this photograph in the archives there uh, that was taken after he and his fellow engineers came to the United States, courtesy of the U.S. government, to begin teaching the United States how to build rockets. There was a photo taken of them in the desert near White Sands where they were living. And it's this old sort of country store. And these former Nazi scientists are standing underneath the sign for this little sort of roadside, dusty looking, sort of looks like a tourist trap sort of shop. And there's a swastika underneath the name of the store, but it's not the swastika in the way that Hitler inverted it to make it his, his symbol for the Nazis. It's what it was in its original form, which it meant something, you know, very different. But the irony you know, of finding yes. that photograph and that they stood there without, and in the photo, right. they just look like they're, they're, it doesn't look tongue in cheek. They're not like pointing at it. It's just like, as a matter of course, they're just standing there. And I've, I'm haunted by that photo yes. um, because I think it just speaks to the fact that they were just so used to seeing that symbol in some form or another, you know, and it had been very yeah. accepted, you know, for, for millennia, you know, a long time that it was, a you know, a symbol that meant something very different, uh, peaceful, in fact. So when I saw that photo in Huntsville, Alabama, the first thought I had was, I cannot wait to show this photo Patri to Patricia. Like, she's going to lose her mind. She's going to freak out. I still think about it's it. If there's something like eerie it's and disturbing. cool and like, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah it, it was really cool. But, but like I said, those were the things that I was so excited to talk about and you were so willing to do it. And um, it fed right into all the other things we were talking about in the bookstore because we always, Patricia and I got, you know, we got sidelined a few times because few we had times. so much in common. We liked to chat and we would get in trouble and, you know, but we could always just sort of cover it up because if we were talking about, you know, roller skating or my book, we would just sort of quickly change it to, you know, oh no, we were talking about this children's book about roller skating or no, we were actually talking about a this book, book club. About World War II history. Yeah. <laughs> You know, duck and cover, it's fine. That reminds me too so much of um, our shared admiration for the author and journalist Annie Jacobson because oh, you're talking yeah. about Operation Paperclip when you're men mentioning Von Braun and coming to the U.S. secretly and how yeah. many of those Nazis just came right on in. Just They sure did and got great government jobs and pensions and retired and um yeah comfy bungalows <laughs> yeah did really well for themselves but yeah annie jacobson's book was um i have not read all of her books i know that you have you're like her, <laughs> her number one fan but she's so smart and she was so unabashed in the way that she talked about these scientists and what they did but also you know in the spirit of, you know, great nonfiction, I, I love nonfiction. I love narrative nonfiction and yeah. I want to learn about history and I want to know the facts, but I also, you know, I really want to be entertained by the storytelling. Uh, and I think gifted historians, that's certainly what they do well, but this is why we all remember a great history teacher we had because they were amazing storytellers and they brought all that to life. But yeah, I don't know how many times we've 
we've waxed poetic about Operation Paperclip. That book just lit my hair on fire. What can I say as well that her book, Area 51, anybody who would be so bold as to do the definitive investigation of Area 51 seriously, like a serious investigation and nestle in it and you know for listeners you you'll just have to read it because yeah. nestled in it is a revelation mm. that that is just staggering and i admire the boldness of a writer a historian or journalist who would do that and another good thing about bookstores who do virtual events or hybrid events, and this is kind of a gift of the pandemic in a way, is when we get to meet authors and we got to meet her virtually and just to hear her do a presentation about her book. And I want to say incredible first platoon, a story of modern war in the age of identity dominance. Yeah, that was that book. And yeah, when you think about authors you've met and you've met so many more than I have, when you think about authors you've met, whom you admire, I'd love to hear because you read so widely and, and you're so adept at writing in so many different areas. Who's somebody that really stuck out to you? Someone whom you admired and met. This is an author. Yes. An author. Okay. Um, gosh, actually I have a really great example. You know, I grew up in Asheville, but before I moved back there in 2014, I was living in Boston and working at Houghton Mifflin Books for Young Readers, um, in the editorial department there. And I was an editorial assistant at the time. And one of the editors that I worked with, uh, this fantastic editor, Margaret Ramo, um, one of my jobs was to read manuscripts that had just come in and, you know, sit down with the editor and talk about it. You know, did you like this book? Did you not like it? You know, I'd have to write an actual reader's report, you know, and assess the book. But sometimes, you know, editors just wanted somebody to talk to about it. And Margaret came over to my cubicle. She had clearly been weeping, like fresh tears, like she was trying to like get herself together to to communicate with me. And she just thrust this manuscript at me, this, you know, stack of papers. And she said, read this, but I need your honest opinion. (laughs) She's like crying and she just walked away. And I was like, okay, well, clearly this is a moving book. You know, she kind of gave it away. And it was The Crossover by Kwame Alexander. And of course it is this moving book of two brothers and they're twins and they're united in their love of basketball. But one of them, it's been a long time since I read the crossover, but they're maturing at different rates. And so there's this sort of, you know, bitter sweetness to their relationship um, as one sort of outgrows the other. And then something tragic happens in their family, kind of, you know, reunites them. And I was completely starstruck by Kwame Alexander from the moment I read that book. I mean, it was it was absolutely stunning. And I was in tears, but it's a novel in verse. I read it, you know, probably within you know an hour or two um, and completely agreed with Margaret's tearful you know, response to the book. It's fantastic. <laughs> and so when Kwame Alexander ends up coming to Boston and he comes into the office, um, you know, you've spent a lot of time reading these people's books and different drafts of their books as they're going through the editorial process. And you start to feel like you get a sense of the person through what they're writing, but you don't ever want to take that for granted, you know? And the man came in to meet everybody and was so engaging, so kind. You know, I told him, you know, that I, that I was working on his book. He thanked me. He asked me, you know, what my job was. He was so glad that I liked the book. And it was one of those, I'd been at Houghton for a little while when I had that experience, but I, I came to, to publishing out of the film and television business where meeting celebrities is usually a part of your job, but it's more often than not crushing because very rarely do they live up to your <laughs> your expectations. <laughs> you know, so I was a little nervous to meet Kwame because I had very much this idealized, you know, yeah. thought of his character and, and who he was. And he absolutely 
just was the person who wrote that book. And it was, you know, very reaffirming to me because I had left the film industry and gone back to graduate school to change careers and, and work in publishing. And then of course ended up writing my own books. And so it was a real validation, you know, yeah. to meet him and have that experience. So that is a very long winded answer <laughs> to your question. Uh, survey says Kwame Alexander. I'm really glad you had a, let's call that a robust response. Yes. And, you know, a robust hand sell as well, because I absolutely, for all the booksellers out there, I absolutely trotted that story out when I was, you know, talking to young readers or their parents right. about a book they should read and why. And I'm like, hey, this guy's the real deal. I met him. I know what's up. He's fantastic. Read his book. I love that you brought up hand selling books because, you know, I, I love to hand sell um, Annie Jacobson's books. And I love um, that. <laughs> Speaking of Nazis, get turning it back to Nazis for just a moment. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> There's a book that sells. I mean, it's not really that I had to hand sell it, but it's just got such staying power. It's called Blitzed. This is where we talk about Patricia founding the, the best true. book club. Like, for one thing, I can't believe I didn't think of it. So I was like jealous from the get go because I was like, I totally should have thought of that. But Patricia's very clever. And one of the things that she and I have in common is wordplay and puns. And like we are unabashedly uh, embracers of puns. And it, it to a point that it, I'm sure we've annoyed a lot of people. But Patricia founded a book club at Malaprops to embrace her love of, uh, you know, hidden and notorious history. It's the Notorious History Book Club. The Notorious HBC. Now, I defy you to come up with a better name for a book club than that. And Blitzed was the book that I, I, I think, I, I don't know, talk about Blitzed because okay. this book is like. Yeah. All right. It's Blitzed, Drugs in the Third Reich. And it's by a German journalist, Norman Oler. And it's translated from German. So the author wanted to write a book about this story that a lot of people had heard in Germany about the amount of drugs that the Third Reich was taking. I mean, of course, <laughs> like after the fact, you know, it makes perfect sense, but that you're also still like, this is what's so astounding about that time in history is like just when you think you've heard it all right you know of course they were sorry continue no it's fine so he was going to write a novel and then he started doing the research and he said this bleep is so crazy i don't <laughs> yeah. need to fictionalize it nope i'm just gonna write it and yep. it's not a big book it's like a little jewel it's like a little gem and it blew my mind. Yeah. But Patricia reads a lot more sophisticated <laughs> history than I do. So Blitz was one that I would actually, you know, be able to embrace. Like most of the books that Patricia reads on the regular, I would dive into if I was researching a topic that I wanted to write about. You know, that's the only circumstance under which I might read it. What was that giant book you read? The Romanovs? No, not the Romanovs. It was like, it was a big economics book. The half um, has never been told. Maybe the, that was it. The half has never been told. Slavery in the making of American capitalism. Do you think that was it by Edward E. Baptiste? That or may Baptist? have been it, but I just remember it was um, a couple of the booksellers uh, at Malaprops were in your book club, oh, think... and they were hauling this book around for the month. <laughs> just like, <laughs> and I was like, "What in the world has she done to you? Like, what is this book?" And you know, there was just, you know, I knew that I was not going to be down for that month of book club. Call me shallow, but I, I'm just well, saying. You know, but, that that's the thing about a book club, right? Is that sometimes the large book must be read. And I, I, understand that. Yes. I had to definitely include that book, uh, Half Has Never Been Told, but probably my favorite is the Romanovs. And oh. that is the Romanovs colon 1613 to 1918 by Simon Sebag Montefiore. And he wrote a book about young Stalin. So this is, this is his area. 
can I just say, if you never read that book, just in your in your free time, just read some of the footnotes because the footnotes are just a riot. The reason I say that is because one of the things that the Russian court would do is uh, they would hold weddings of dwarfs or uh, really large people that they considered giants. They would hold these actual weddings and round up the people in the empire. What in the world? Because they're, you know, that's the privilege of the imperialist. They right? did it for entertainment? Yeah. They do it for entertainment. That's horrific. Again, it's like blitzed. You don't have to fictionalize it because what was really yeah. going on was so strange and bizarre. And that's why I love Notorious History Book Club for kind of the exploration of these strange, hidden, uh, disturbing, no, no good guys a lot of bad guys, or at least a lot of people in the proverbial gray hats, no white yeah. hats and black hats. And that's, wow. that's why I loved uh, that book. And when you started, when you started working on In the Shadow of the Moon, I said, oh yeah, I love this. Yeah. It's, it's Thank you for honest. that. You know, authors do notice that. It's like, it's one thing to like go into a bookstore and they're like, oh, do they have a copy of my book? But like, I mean, and I know like, especially during the pandemic, when all of these, you know, wildly famous people were being interviewed either about the pandemic or just in general, you know, but everybody was broadcasting ostensibly from their home and there would be like Anthony Fauci would be talking and like you see his, he had, the, and I loved this about him. Like the guy is this incredible scientist, right? One of the great, you know, medical minds of our time. And I'm like scanning his bookshelves and he's obviously, it looked like he was in his home office, but he didn't too. have immaculate bookshelves. They were kind of staggered and there were papers flopped over. And I was like, Fauci's just a regular, like, you know, he's that person who hoards books too. And he's not that uptight about keeping him so immaculate. And I mean, I nearly put my eyes out trying to like, see what, like, what does Anthony Fauci read in his spare time? What's you know, doing? it was the greatest. Um, but before we get too far away from the Romanoff book, this is bonus content <laughs> that I feel honor bound to share. So uh, we're big fans of costume dramas in our house and we've seen them all, right? Name it. We've seen them all. And so, you know, every few months I think, oh, we got to find another costume drama to watch. And so we're on Netflix and I'm looking around and I find this, what looks like a costume drama called The Last Czars. Have you heard about this? I've heard about this. I have not watched it. How so is we, it? We start watching it. And the reason that I'm interested is because the author, uh, Montefiore, of that big, blue, beautiful book about the Romanovs, I love that cover. Yeah. Um, he's one of the consultants on this. And so it's a documentary. So they're, it's a docudrama. So gotcha. they'll act out the scenes of what was going on with the czar. And then they'll cut back to these three or four experts that they have who are brilliantly contextualizing really? all of this stuff. What we did not expect. So we sit down to watch it and we're thinking Downton Abbey, right? <laughs> it was like Bridgerton meets documentary. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the most uh, graphic documentary I've ever seen. Really? This is how you get people to pay attention to history. Okay. Like I'm talking full frontal nudity, like uh, of men and women, you know, Rasputin having orgies. Like it was, they went there. It, like, I mean, I don't even know what to say. Like I was expecting BBC and I got Cinemax <laughs> is what happened. Like what channel is this? Who's, who's messing with our subscription? And when, and when it started happening, you know, we're looking at each other like, is it like, what? Is <laughs> Pardon me. It was so funny because it was like, and it wasn't it's necessarily, shocking. you know, it was really yeah. prudish, but it was just that it was, I mean, it was a documentary. We just weren't expecting that right. part of it, but the <laughs> history, I'm like that person. Oh, I only read the articles and play, but it's, but it was they like, really have to in depth investigative journalism. In this. But seriously, they would have this racy, racy scene. And then they cut back to, you know, Montefiore <laughs> and he's like, and the man's brilliant and he's giving yeah. this succinct like, and I, I mean, of course I knew about the Romanovs. I'm sure I didn't know as much about them as you did when I watched it, but 
I mean, Sar Nicholas was just the worst. Right. I mean, just one of the worst world leaders of all time. Like he, he could not get it right, no matter no matter how hard he tried. But anyway, all That's of that hilarious. to say, um, if anybody likes costume dramas with a little heat, with um, less costume, sometimes there's no costume. <laughs> It's yeah. <laughs> well said, my friend, as ever. Yeah. So the last Zars, it's on Netflix and uh check it out. Check it out. That's right. I love that you uh, mentioned that because uh the Notorious History Book Club is getting ready to do something really special and that's another great thing about bookstores and book clubs and things like that is that you really get to be a part of a community and find, yeah. find, you know, people who are, want to, want to read in the areas you want to read in. And we are getting ready to meet for a book called a fatal thing happened on the way to the forum murder um, in Ro- <laughs> ancient Rome. You can pick a book with a title. That's for sure. And of course it's a play on that play. Yeah. Yeah. Right. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. And the author is a historian named Emma Southern. She's going to zoom in from Belfast, Northern Ireland to talk to the book club. Oh, my God. Let me just say, it may be kind of like you tuning into the last czars and saying uh, they do call it a costume drama because people wear clothes. (laughs) It could be (laughs) one of those moments because she's quite irreverent and funny. And that's one of the things that I really love about being in a bookstore where you've got people yeah. who are so smart, like you are, it just just playing off of, just riffing off of a book, a title, an author, an interaction, just anything. Well, and then using that to, you know, actualize an event in the store. I mean, we tried to get Annie Jacobson, or you tried to. I was just supporting you. I was like cheerleading. You were the one actually doing the legwork. But you were like, I'm going to get Annie Jacobson in here. And I was like, hell yes, let's get Annie Jacobson. And then you tried once and she couldn't come. And then it was, was it during the pandemic that she came? Yeah, yeah. 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 Then during the pandemic, it's like, well, everybody can go everywhere now because we, we Zoom all over the world. And like, there she was. Good and man. I think that that's, you know, and people that work in bookstores already know this, but like, that's sort of the holy grail of event planning. It's like when you're either getting that person in the store and one of your colleagues, you know that when you tell them that this person's coming to the store, they're going to cry or they're going to just scream and yell. They're going to be so excited. Like yeah. that, when that spirit of goodwill between booksellers, you know, sort of comes together to create an event for the whole community. Like, yeah. This is why I don't understand why more people just don't hang out in independent bookstores. It's like, just walk in the door. You never know who's going to be there. You know, you just don't know what's going to be going on. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things that I I know you really love, Eric Larson. Yeah. And I would love to hear what you have to say because you've written about weather events. And I would love to hear what you have to say about Isaac Storm and why you care about that book in particular. You know, the first book I ever wrote for young readers was a middle grade nonfiction called Eye of the Storm, NASA Drones and the Race to Crack the Hurricane Code. It was all about how NASA scientists uh, were repurposing this Department of Defense Global Hawk drone um, to do high altitude hurricane research. And this particular drone had never, you know, dropped bombs anywhere. It was just like a demonstration plane. But I was just so moved by the fact that these NASA scientists were repurposing this warbird ostensibly as, you know, a tool for good and to advance science. And so I started researching um, hurricanes and, you know, historic hurricanes throughout history. I live on the coast of North Carolina now, and I lived here once before 10 years ago for about 10 years and went through a number of pretty terrible hurricanes. So I know what that's like to go through one. And so as I was researching for maybe um, a sidebar in the book about historic hurricanes, I I wanted to read about the Galveston hurricane of 1900. And uh, this was the first book of Eric Larson's that I ever read. And it's called Isaac Storm. And it is a pretty scathing indictment of a man named Isaac Klein who was 
uh, one of the first weathermen. These are sort of the, the early years of the National Weather Service. And this was, of course, you know, uh, around the turn of the century when men specifically, white men, most of all, believed that they could, you know, do just about anything, including harness the power of nature and bend it to their will, right? And so Klein was the Galveston sort of local weather guru that was affiliated with the National Weather Service. And Larson's book is all about how he basically just blew it. He was the most educated guy there that could have warned everybody that this was going to happen. And, you know, Larson's assertion is that he, through hubris, ego, you know, these are themes that, you know, attract me to books and writing in general. I mean, if Von Brown was nothing but a portrait of, you know, hubris and ego, and Isaac Klein is the same way. And so he writes this book about how Klein, despite his knowledge, despite having be, being a naturalist and spending all this time outside, he just was clueless about everything that was happening. And even when he writes about how it was possible that his instincts were telling him what was really happening, he ignored them. And the appeal of that book, as with all of Larson's books that I've read and with great nonfiction that I love, is that you know what's going to happen, right? It's history. So we know the outcome and we have the, the benefit of hindsight now, which is a little unfair to the people who lived through it. But, you know, this is, you know, history, history has its eyes on all of us, right? <laughs> but you, you just see how, how this guy just absolutely blew it. And, you know, thousands of people died. Um, I can't remember the exact number in the Galveston hurricane, um, but he does such a beautiful job of using the historical record to extrapolate, you know, where the street was and, you know, what the street was made of and which business was on which side of the street. So he builds these beautiful scenes in your mind because he has done such painstaking work in the historical record, you know, looking at the layout of the town back then and which way the streets ran and whose house was where. I can only imagine you know, what his office looks like when he's working, you know, he must just have maps and, you know, mine looks like a nerdy serial killer lives here with just like post-its everywhere and random notes. I'd like to think that Eric Larson's probably a lot more sophisticated and organized, but I was just going to say that the whole point of that book is that Klein just misses every sign along the way and that his hubris and ego basically cost everyone their lives because he was the only one that could do anything. I mean, there's this one scene in the book, and then I'll stop talking about Isaac Storm. There's one scene in the book where he talks about how the day that, and if you've, if you've ever lived anywhere in a hurricane zone, storm surge is, there's lots of horrible things in hurricanes, but storm surge is the worst. That's what devastated Florida a couple of months ago. And um, as the storm was, you know, building out in the ocean, you know, the water's already starting to, you know, sort of start to pile up on the shore. And when the storm came, it came at this moment where this tremendous heat wave over most of the country was breaking. And so these people were so grateful for a break in the heat that they all ran to the beach. So there is this like cinematic horror movie scene where these people are like playing in the early waves that are going to later drown them when the hurricane comes. And he just writes all of this in this foreboding, perceptive way that is, uh, that you know what's going to happen, but you're just, the pages, like you just can't turn them fast enough. I recommend that book to anybody. Isaac Storm, it's one of Larson's older books. Um, I don't know if a lot of people still pay attention to it, but don't sleep on it if you like um, those kind of stories, because it is fantastic. I would be remiss if I didn't, and I just even think about it, it's getting a little choked up because I saw an article in the New York Times today about the gloomy octopus. And I don't know if you've seen this yet. So you mm -hmm. probably already know where I'm going. But these are the, the this type of octopus sucks up silt. And when it gets mad, it blasts silt <laughs> at its neighbor and throws things. So it's one of the few animals that actually throws things. <laughs> and it's hilarious. Just go look at New York Times today and they've got some video. Well, I'm saying that because you turned me on to Cy Montgomery's 
The Soul of an Octopus. Oh, love that book so much. There, you know, she wrote The Good, Good Pig. She's written other things, but I owe you a real debt of gratitude. And that's what oh, I'm so glad a person are. who is generous of spirit and is intellectually generous too. And that's you, Amy Cherix. That's how I feel about you, Patricia Furnish. <laughs> you told me about that book and that book was a game changer for me in terms of how I saw creative nonfiction, narrative nonfiction, wow. the natural world, what you can oh. do with the beauty of the, the, the power word. of books, man. Yeah. And that, that I thought of you today, I knew we were going to talk, but when I said, I saw that article and watched that video, I just, could, I just started laughing, but I was really touched by it. And so I want to definitely make sure that I say, those of you who go in a bookstore, if you work in a bookstore, if you're a customer in a bookstore, people who work in bookstores care about books and they'll yeah. tell you about books that change their lives and their friends change their lives too with book recommendations. 100%. Soul of an Octopus. Yeah. I love that book. Yeah, and I want to thank you for show, showing me that book. They don't call her the Emily Dickinson of nonfiction for nothing. Um, <laughs> Oh my gosh. You know what? I'm realizing we're kind of getting close on our time. Out of time. How did it, how did it go that fast? I don't <sighs> I know. know. I know we could do this all night. Um, That's right. You used to say, I love this. You'd say uh, here all night, folks here all night. <laughs> Amy, where can they find out more about you? Um, you can reach out to me on my website, which is amycherix.com. I am on Twitter for the time being. Who knows how that's going to go down? Look at Elon Musk. My Twitter handle is at A Cherix. And on Instagram, I am at Amy Cherix. What about you, Patricia? Can our uh, friends find you anywhere? They can find me at patriciafurnish.com. And it has my videography there and a little bit more info about my talk show on history, current events, and books on Asheville FM 103.3 called Southern Reckoning. And I'm also the news director at Asheville FM now. So you can tune in there to the Asheville FM News Hour, and sometimes you'll hear me talking about local and state news. That's exactly right. Thank you so much, Patricia, for, for chatting. This has just been delightful, of course, it has as ever. Been. I mean, I knew it would be, but yeah. you know, formally know. speaking, it's been a delight. I did some preemptive laughing just because I knew it was going to be funny. So I just <laughs> it's like, well, that's going to be funny anyway. And I really appreciate getting to spend time with you and talk to you and learn more about you and what you like to do because you're endlessly fascinating and you're a dear friend and i want to thank everybody for listening yes thank you everybody for listening this has been great a real treat thank you to amy and patricia for taking the time today and to all of you for listening and to my wonderful technical editor rebecca spees for turning this episode around on really short notice after the files got uploaded to the totally wrong place and neither of us could find them for a few days Oops. Since this is our final season, we are spotlighting a different book selling podcast at the end of each episode. And given the number of nonfiction books talked about in today's podcast, you should go listen to Just the Right Book podcast done by the team over at RJ Julia. It is fantastic. The co-owner Roxanne Cody talks to nonfiction authors in every single episode. Otherwise, you can follow us on Instagram at MissShelvedPod and Twitter for however long that is around at the same handle. We will be back in two weeks with our final official episode. So we will have quite a few bits of bonus content after that. Until then, happy reading.